Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His Son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied Him in the presence of Pilate, when He was determined to let Him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I what, excuse me, I what that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all His prophets that Christ should suffer, He hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a privilege it is to hear Your Word this morning. What a privilege it is to be able to have a Bible in our hands. Lord, may we not take this lightly or think it insignificant. For in your word, Lord, in the scriptures, we have your plan of salvation. We have all that we need to know to be part of your family and your kingdom to receive your forgiveness. And we just pray this morning that the Holy Spirit, whom you sent, will teach us all things and give us understanding and the wisdom to apply this precious word to our lives and therefore affect others. In Christ's holy name, amen. Now, one of the greatest privileges of being a kid is the concept of what we called the do-over. How many of you remember when you were a kid, ever with your friends or maybe even with your brothers and sisters, ever exercising your right when you were playing a game or something for the do-over? You throw a bad pitch in baseball, playing in the yard with your friends, and you say, wait a minute, I want a do-over. You get up there maybe when you're batting and you strike out and you tell your brother who's pitching, wait a minute, I want a do-over. You roll the dice in Monopoly and things don't quite go your way. Maybe you get the dreaded snake eyes and you say, wait a minute, can I have a do-over? And I'm sure we have some teachers and people working in the schools. You probably hear kids on the playground and in the class saying, do-over. I thought it was awesome as a kid. It was kind of like a reset. You know, when I was growing up in the 80s, the Nintendo came out. And there was a button on that Nintendo that said, reset. And so when you were playing your video game, if you, were, if you were playing like a war game or something and your man got killed, you could just hit reset. Or if you were playing a football game and you, the first play of the game, you threw an interception, all you have to do is hit reset and things started over. Anytime things weren't going quite like you want them, if your friends and those that you were participating in the game with were okay with it, you could get a, do, a do-over. And man, that was an awesome thing. Now, when, when it comes to our adult lives, do-overs aren't always so easy, are they? You can't just, if you're having problems at work and maybe you make a mistake on some paperwork, you don't always just get to say, I want a do-over. When you have, you know, issues in your relationships, in your marriage, mistakes that you make, 
you can't always just press a reset button and everything go back from the start. We come to understand that as adults, sometimes things that we say, things that we do, mistakes that we make, leave an impression that lasts a long time, if not forever. We don't just get to say to our spouse sometimes. We don't just get to say to our boss. We don't get to say to our best friend. We don't get to say to our neighbor, wait a minute, forget that, I want to do over. You know, the game of life many times is different than the games that we used to play as children. And do-overs as adults aren't always possible, seemingly, and they certainly aren't as easy as they were when we were kids. Now, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to our relationships with our loved ones and with other adults, we may not always get do-overs, or they may be difficult, but with the God that we serve, thankfully, we serve a God, we know a God, we have a God, the one true God who does believe in do-overs. He does. In fact, when you sit there and you read in the Scriptures Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus on that night, that whole discussion about being born again could be simplified in a way to talking about a do-over. You know, Jesus says that you must be born again or you must be born from above to inherit the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, being an adult, having experiences of life, probably having trouble with this concept of do-over, speaking in the flesh and thinking physically says, well, how can that be? Can, I, can a man, once he has grown, be, go back into his mother's womb? And Jesus kind of says, you don't understand the type of do-over that I'm talking about. No, a man does not come back into his mother's womb. A man must be born of spirit and of water. A man must be born of the truth. A man must be born from above. He's talking to Nicodemus about a spiritual do-over. And yes, God does operate in that way. You know, it's so funny when we think of deep and profound spiritual things, a lot of times we can relate them to things we experience as a child. And perhaps that's why Jesus says, you must have the faith of the child. You must come to me as a child. Maybe children, and I think we can witness that with what Bunky does, maybe children sometimes have a more profound understanding of things in their simplicity than we do. I really believe that sometimes. Children believe in a do-over. God does do-overs. What is God's do-over? What do we mean by this? Well, the simple fact that even though we were created in the image of God, our sin has caused that gulf between us and our Creator. Our sin separates us from God. But God, who in all of His power could easily just destroy us and vanquish us and just wipe us out from existence, He does not do that. He is perfectly capable of doing so and would be just in doing so. But you know what? He says, no, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a do-over. I'm going to offer you grace. I'm going to offer you another chance, another opportunity. I'm going to give you forgiveness, and I'm going to allow you to start with me a clean slate. And that is so difficult sometimes for us to understand because even in our relationships with other adults, we may forgive someone we never really can just start with a clean slate, can we? But with God, we can. You know why? Because He says, I'll throw those sins into the sea of death. Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Yes, when, you see, when God forgives us, He doesn't just say, all right, I'm going to forgive you this time and you know, we're going to see how you do. He says, no, I forgive you. I am infusing my grace into you. I am erasing your sins. I am blotting them out. I am cleansing you thoroughly of this. And yes, 
Because we are flesh and blood, we may continue to sin and and make mistakes. But as we go to Him and we confess our sins, we know that He is faithful and just and will forgive us. God believes in the do-over. God believes in the second chance. The Bible says God is long-suffering and patient. So greatly more so than we are as human beings. Some examples of do-overs that Jesus Himself has offered people. Think about Matthew, one of His disciples. The one who would eventually write, inspired by the Spirit, the Gospel of Matthew. He was a tax collector, right? He sat in his little tax room and he was an extortioner. Tax collectors at that time were. That's why they were so hated. They not only worked for the Romans, who many Israelites would have considered enemies, but the majority of them also took a little on the side and charged people more taxes than they really should have. And many of them became rich and obsessed with wealth. And you know what? Jesus walks by and He calls them from His table. And He says, Matthew, you tax collector, you hated of Israel, you sinner, you, one who, you the one who extorts people from their money, people who can't only pay, pay for the bread for their children to eat, but you're taking money from them. You, Matthew, come and follow me. You know why? Because I'm going to give you a do-over. I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you an opportunity for redemption. I'm going to give you an opportunity to see what life is all about. Yes, Matthew, you get a do-over. And then there's that incident where the religious leaders bring Jesus, the woman who is caught in adultery, caught in the very act. And by the Jewish law, by the Mosaic law, guess what? They're like, does she need to be stoned? That's what the law says. And of course, we know the story. Jesus begins to write in the dirt and He says, Ye who sin not, cast the first stone. But the emphasis on that story today is the fact that when all of the people have left because they know that they're sinners as well, He goes up to the young lady and even though she was caught in the sinful act of adultery, you know what He says to her? You got a do-over. You got a do-over. He says, You're forgiven. Go and sin no more you have another opportunity to live a life that is pleasing to your God. And then one of the greatest examples of do-over in my book is Lazarus. I mean, here was Lazarus. You know the story where they send word to Jesus because his friend Lazarus is dying and Jesus kind of hesitates. You know, he's got a plan here, but he kind of holds back and doesn't go immediately to Lazarus' house. But he comes several days later and, and of course, uh, Lazarus' sisters come out and meet him and said, you're too late, he's already dead. And what does he do? He shows his power by calling Lazarus to come forth out out of that grave and he tells the people to take off his grave clothes. Man, if bringing someone back to life isn't an opportunity for a do over, I don't know what is. Now, we don't think that Lazarus was any kind of a sinful man. In fact, he was a follower of Jesus. He was a friend of Jesus. But I just brought that story out for you to understand that, yes, God does do do do-overs. He gives people another chance. He gives an opportunity for the slate to be wiped clean. And then, of course, we look at the cross. We look at Jesus. Why do we have the opportunity for a do-over? Why do we have an opportunity for our sins to be forgiven? Why do we have an opportunity to have a relationship with God? Because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was up on that cross, and He was bearing the sins of the world, and on the third day He came out of that grave and resurrected, you know what? God was giving the entire world a do-over an opportunity to start again. To everyone that believes, God says, you get another chance. That is why I sent my son. That is why he suffered. That is why he endured all of the hate, all of the ridicule, all of the shame. That is why he felt the physical pain in his body and the spiritual pain in his soul. That is why He was laid in a grave. And that is why the third day He took up His life again because God is a God of do-overs. 
And in this context of the passage that I read, here we have this lame man that had been lame since birth. And he, the, the Bible says that they just sat him at this gate in the temple, a gate called Beautiful, and every day he just could just barely hold his hand out to receive alms from those that would walk by. And he reaches out his hand as Peter and John walk by, and Peter says, we don't have money to give you, but what we can give you is far greater. He looks down at that man and he says, you get a do-over. And he pulls that man up and the strength goes into his legs and the man became so excited he was just kind of leaping and jumping for joy. He had a new start on life. And then what Peter does, he says, now I'm going to use this. God has given us the power to do this miracle. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to reach as many people as I can. And I know that there are some that, that of the authorities that will come and question me. They might even arrest me. They might try to shut me down and close my mouth, but there's going to be people before they have an opportunity to do that that need to hear the word that God does do-overs. And you know what? The Bible says after he gave this sermon that over 5,000 people heard and believed, 5,000 people got a do-over. But there's a, there's a little thing here we need, to, we need to mention before we move on. In the last part of this passage, because I don't want you to think that it's just like resetting a video game. You know, when I was playing Nintendo growing up, I don't know how many times I kept hitting that reset button. And yes, God is the God of do-overs. We've made that clear through this sermon, or at least I've attempted the best I could. But this is what the sermon that, that Peter preached, and this is what the people heard and understood who believed, the 5,000 or more. Verse 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. You see, when we come to God in a contrite and humble heart and we repent of our sins and God's grace just as infuses us and just encapsulates us and just, just sh is shed abroad among us, that is our do-over. But it's not just, just going to keep asking somebody for forgiveness and continuing to do the same thing over and over. Eventually, that person you know, is going to write you off. But God says to repent. And basically that means to change your mind about the way you were going. Be converted and start following the way of Jesus. And that's so hard for some people to do because they can't repent because they really don't feel like they've done anything wrong. They just want to get out of trouble for the moment and then they want to go right back into the life that they were living. But that's not the conversion that Peter is talking about in this sermon that is not the conversion that the Bible teaches. The Bible says to repent, to change your mind about the sinful way that you were living, and to trust in God and allow Him to lead your life. Repent and be converted. And then it says your sins will be blotted out. You have that do-over that God's grace gives to you. And then I love the last part of this where it says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The times of refreshing. You know, the, to me, the, the most beautiful idea of springtime is it's kind of like nature's way, God's creation of a do-over, right? I mean, everything starts to fall in the autumn season, and it's kind of pretty in autumn because you have the leaves and stuff, but then by the time it gets into winter, all the vegetation is gone and everything looks dead and it's dreary and it's overcast and it's cold. But then comes the spring and then comes the flowers. And the ladies this morning were mentioning the dogwoods and the Bradford pears and all of those things. And it's a do-over. And it's refreshing. And it's wonderful to be able to go outside and it's 70 degrees and the sun is shining and the flowers and feels good but not as good as it feels when you've led a life of sin and made a lot of mistakes and you're at your wit's end and your heart is broken and you have damaged relationships, you have hurt many people and you have nowhere else to go and you look up to heaven and you say, God, if you're real, I need a do-over. And God says, 
I am real. I did create you. I did love you. I do love you. And I will come into your heart. I will blot out all of your sins. I will bring refreshing to you. And I will give you a do-over. Thankfully, we have a God that does do-overs. And so I want to ask you here as I conclude, do you need a do-over? Do you need to experience God's forgiveness? Or perhaps you've served God most of your life, but you're still kind of in that winter period of your faith and you just need some refreshing and some renewal. Go to God because it is in His presence, as the Scripture says, that we experience those times of refreshing. And maybe there's a relationship in your life right now between someone that was a friend, someone you've loved, and there's all kinds of animosity there, and you would really like a do-over, but it seems impossible. Well, my suggestion would be Get things right with God first. And as He takes away all of that pride, all of that selfishness, all of that pretense, takes the scales off your eyes and helps you to see things as they truly are, perhaps by His grace, you and that person can have a do-over. With men, it is impossible. But all things are possible with God. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that you give us another chance. We look back through the scriptures, and from Genesis to Revelation, it is full of people that were not perfect, that made a lot of mistakes, some of them more than us, but that you gave another chance, and they had faith, and you cleansed them, and you healed them, and you restored that relationship with you. And we know, God, you will do the same thing for us. We need to repent. We need to understand when we do wrong. We need to ask for your forgiveness, Lord. And you have promised us times of refreshing, a do-over. Thank you, God. Please touch each and every heart today. In Jesus' name, amen.